Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 16th of January and I hope everyone is having a great week. As always, if this is useful, please go ahead and like, subscribe, comment and share and hit the bell icon to get notified of new content. As always, I have the chapters in the description. You can jump below if you're interested in a particular update and don't want to watch the whole video. In terms of new content this week, Last week, I created a full eight and a half hour AZ900 course. So this week, I released a study cram. Uh, I already had one, it was like an hour long. This is a completely updated one. It's three and a half hours long, designed to watch just before you're gonna take the exam to kind of refresh all of those concepts. Then I created a really quick video about how you might go about learning Azure if you're embarking on that in 2022. I did want to remind everyone, YouTube does have a search function. A lot of people keep asking, do you have a video on X, Y, or Z? So just, it may not be shown if you go to my home channel, and this is any YouTube video, if you don't see it, you'll kind of see an arrow that you can scroll over, and then you'll see the magnifying glass to search, type in what you want, and it will give you your answer. Okay, so, new features. So Azure Static Web Apps now has this enterprise grade edge in preview. Remember, Azure Static Web Apps is that super easy to stand up, Git DevOps driven solution for pre-rendered content. It just easily makes it available and distributed. Now what this does is it actually now will use Azure Front Door and the Content Delivery Network to provide a global edge presence for that solution. So rather than it being just within a very confined location, it's not gonna be globally distributed. That gives you a lower latency because I'm gonna be closer to where people might be accessing that content. I get an enhanced resiliency. And then I can also take advantage of things like the distributed denial of service protections we get with those features. We also get native IPv6 HTTP2. So that is available in preview. Azure Kubernetes Service now has this Azure AD workload identity. And this will basically be a replacement for the current in preview solution for pod-based identity that uses a managed identity. And then there's some specialist pods that run in AKS to then go and give tokens to the various pods that have been authorized to use it. This new solution will work on any Kubernetes deployment. So this could be, yes, AKS, but it could be another cloud. It could be on-premises. It works for Linux and Windows, while the old solution only works for Linux. And it gets rid of all those kind of custom pods. Instead, what it's going to use is Kerberos now has its own native OpenID Connect Federation solution and service account token volume projection. What that really means is now Kerberos, sorry, Kerberos, Kubernetes, can now give out tokens via these service accounts. So pods can get a token issued by Kubernetes. And then with this OIDC federation, it can then go and exchange that Kubernetes given token for one from Azure AD. So if super quickly we think about this for a second, you can imagine now I could have my kind of my AKS environment and I have some pod. And what now can happen is Kubernetes can issue this a, a token. So I get my token from Kubernetes. But what that pod can now do is if I think, oh, I also have Azure AD, I can take that pod and take that token, say, hey, I would like an Azure AD generated token. And there's an app registration that would be used for the identity for that token. Well, Azure AD has to be able to go and validate that token, verify it. So the other part of the solution is we have that kind of open IDC federation capability on the Kubernetes cluster. So now Azure AD can kind of say, hey, I just need to validate this, check it, validate that token. And then once it's got that, it can say, okay, well now here's a token I'm generating, here you go. So now if there's other resources that kind of trust Azure AD, 
it can now present the token from Azure AD to go and get access to other stuff. So this is all this new solution. It's available up in GitHub. You can go and look at the documentation. You can go and look at the solution. But this is the, the new solution for, hey, I want to get a token. I want to integrate with Azure AD as one example of someone that can actually go and do that federation, the OpenID Connect federation with a Kubernetes cluster. And I keep wanting to say Kerberos. Okay. So the DCSV2 and V3 series VMs have had a price reduction. So if you remember, these VMs are that confidential compute. They have those secure enclaves that let us have an area of protected memory that my application can take advantage of for those highly sensitive operations. So it's up to now, I think, a 33% price reduction. It took effect from 1st of January 2022, so it's there already. But basically, there, there is no premium add-on for these um, secure compute VMs over just general purpose on a per virtual CPU level. So there isn't a sort of price premium for them. On to networking, I talked about this previously. Uh, obviously, there's the basic load balancer SKU and the standard load balancer SKU. The standard has things like zone redundancy, zonal, higher performance, higher number of backends within a certain VNet. Uh, both inbound and outbound front ends is secure by default and much, much more. So now using this PowerShell, I can perform that upgrade. Now obviously the SKU of the public IP has to match the SKU of the load balancer. So if I'm moving from a basic load balancer, it means I'm also moving from a basic public IP. So it will also upgrade the public IP to a standard public IP and it will also change it from a dynamic to a static because we only support static for a standard public IP. Now this is for the public load balancer only. Um, the internal has a different process that is in the documentation. And in the description below, I have the link to this entire process. But now, hey, I can use a script to do those moves from the basic to the standard. And this is not gonna apply to many people, but when I establish a VPN connection, typically when I talk to AWS, they use the AP IPA address ranges. That's that whole automatic private IP addressing the 169254 that normally we shudder if we see. Well, typically that is actually used as part of that BGP um, session establishment with AWS. So what you can now do is I can actually have multiple custom BGP addresses from that range if I'm leveraging that. On the storage side, so the root cert for Azure storage will be changing in February 2022. Now for most of us, this is not a big deal. If we go and look, so if we jump over to this, and this wondering why am I doing this? So this is a shared access signature to a file I have in a storage account. And if we go and look today, if we go and look at the certificate, we can go and look at the complete certification path. And what we see today is this DigiCert Baltimore root certificate. That is the root of all of the kind of trust for the certificate. Well, what's happening is this cert expires in 2025. And so obviously they don't like things that expire in a cert world reasonably soon. So what's happening is that cert is going to be changing. Now this shouldn't matter really to many people unless you are explicitly specifying a list of acceptable CAs, i.e. certificate pinning, you're gonna be fine. It's gonna to move to a DigiCert Global G2 root um, at the root of the signing trust chain, which is fine for nearly everyone, but just be advised that it is gonna change. So if you are doing certificate pinning, you're gonna to wanna to go and make sure you update because from Feb 2022, that root signing certificate for Azure Storage is going to change. Uh, Ultra Disks are now available in West US 3. Remember, Ultra Disks are not only the highest performing disks, they let you independently tune the IOPS and the throughput from the capacity. And I can also dynamically change the IOPS and the throughput even when the disk is actually in use. So now available in West US 3 as well. Miscellaneous. So Azure Advisor 
has made some big changes to how it recommends how you should use a new SKU. So Azure Advisor is great. You should be checking it out weekly. Advisors across uh, resiliency and cost and optimization and a whole number of things, security. But one of the things it did in the past is it would look at how you're using a VM and it would recommend to resize it. But it would only recommend to resize it in the same VM SKU. Well, remember different VM SKUs have different ratios of CPU to memory. So maybe I was using the wrong SKU. A whole bunch of memory is empty, but it's using all the CPU. Well, now it will actually advise across SKUs. So if it's seeing the usage pattern, it's like actually this would be a better fit for a different type of SKU based on those ratios and type of resource I'm using. It will now recommend across those SKUs. So that's actually a really big deal. It will now also recommend across versions. So hey, you're gonna get a better performance based on if you move from a V2 to V3, it's gonna tell me that as well. And it does pay attention to things like accelerated networking support, premium storage support, availability set inclusion, etc., to make sure the recommendations are actually actionable by you. So basically just better all up recommendations now from Azure Advisor. Conditional access templates, wanna make sure you're all aware of these. These are in preview. And essentially what these do is if we go and look super quickly, it's just a place to get started. So if I was to go and look at my conditional access, rather than starting from a, a blank canvas, I can now say new policy, but hey, I wanna do it from a template. Then it has a whole set of templates, either from the perspective of an identity or from the device. So you select which category you care about, and then it's gonna give you a list of templates you can start from. Now you can change these as much as you want, but it's just a nice starting point when I'm thinking about, hey, I need to create some conditional access policies. It's gonna make it just really that much easier for you. Staying on Azure AD, Azure AD Continuous Access Evaluation has gone GA. Now I've talked about this many times in the past. This is the whole idea that historically, when I actually get my access token, it's short-lived. Uh, an hour and it's short-lived because there's no way to revoke it. Once I have the token, I can't do anything about it. So it's short-lived so that every hour I have to go back to Azure AD with my refresh token and get a new um, access token. And at that point, it can go and check, has your account been disabled and things like that. With continue, continuous access evaluation, there's actually a communication established between the app that's taking the token and Azure AD. It can go and request the list of applicable policies, maybe it's based on location, and it can be notified of certain events. So if my account is revoked, if my account is disabled or deleted, if my password changes, if my location changes, if my user risk changes, it could then refuse to honor the token. So what this lets me do is I can actually now give out tokens longer than an hour, it can be long lived like a day because it can now be revoked. So I did a lot more detail on my recent Azure AD resiliency talk, but this is now generally available. And you can actually see it in continue um, conditional access now as a switch, you can kind of say, hey, I want this or not. Remember the, the app has to actually do things around this. Um, I wanna make sure everyone saw this. So there's an exam simulation site so if you ever kind of panic, you've not done a Microsoft exam before, and you're wondering, well, what's the experience gonna be like? You can go to this location, and it basically fakes the experience. Now, it's the experience that it's focusing on here. It's not actually real questions, but it gives me an idea of what I'm gonna see, what I'm gonna experience, and it shows me the type of questions I'm gonna get. Oh, okay, oh, multiple choice. Um, oh, okay, I have to select the right answers and I'm not even reading what the questions are, so don't, I'm not an idiot if I'm getting it wrong. Oh, okay, I have to drag and drop in the right areas, etc. So it's just a place you can go and if you've never done a Microsoft exam before, and I do include the link to this in the description below and in my learn.onboard2azure.com site if you're curious, um, it's just a nice place to get a little bit of comfort so it takes away one element of the uncertainty that can cause us a bit of apprehension. So that's there. 
Azure Policy now has support for Azure Site Recovery. Remember, Azure Site Recovery is that ability to add that resiliency to our virtual machines, for example. Well, now there's actually some built-in policies to actually say, okay, I, I want that. So if I was to jump over, I can now go to Policy, and I can now get this deployed just via Azure Policy. I don't have to do anything particular. So if I just search for disaster, there we go. And I could use it for compliance. I could just track it as well. But hey, configure disaster recovery on virtual machines by enabling replication via Azure Site Recovery. So there's now some built in and I can audit virtual machines without that disaster recovery as well. So some built in nice policies now all around um, Azure Site Redundancy. I don't know I'm saying that wrong. All right. Uh, finally, Azure Backup. They had a whole bunch of changes around automation. So there's now CLI commands for pretty much all aspects of Azure Backup, that's GA. There's now PowerShell and CLI support for the different types of backup vault workloads, so Postgres, database, um, blob, disks. There's Terraform support, there's Bicep templates, which remember Bicep is the new recommended declarative um, technology to use for provisioning resources. Behind the scenes, it transpiles into ARM JSON anyway, so it has all the same capabilities, but that's a lot more human friendly. And as new features come along, again, PowerShell CLI support. So that's the uh, bucket of updates. I hope that was useful. As always, thanks for watching, and until next week, take care.